Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you. Uh, music team, would you come and join us uh, as we start this morning? Those of you who are visitors and guests, always good to have new folks, visitors with us. You are very, very welcome and trust that you will feel together with us a sense of the presence of God. Our songs this morning, our first songs, are going to be focused around the glory and the, the otherness of God and the greatness of God, which will be the theme of our service today. It says in Revelation chapter 4, it's the, the, the cry of the angels as John looks into, gets this wonderful vision of heaven. And this is what he hear, hears them saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honour and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever, the others there fall down before him and worship. And they lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, our Lord and God. You are worthy to receive glory and honour and power for you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being. As we start our time of worship this morning, the music team are going to lead us in singing two songs, Only a Holy God, then Kevin's going to lead us in our opening prayer and we're going to sing the Revelation song, which is really based around some of these. For some of you that might be a new song, but it's, it's a lovely, it's a beautiful song. We've sung it in the evenings. You will very quickly pick it up. Let's worship our Lord together.
Loving Heavenly Father, we've just sung the words, who else could rescue me from my failing? Who else would offer his only son? Who else invites me to call him Father? Only a holy God, only my holy God. Lord, I pray that each one of us here today would know you, not only as a holy God, but also as our loving Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen. Let's take our seats. And that's what we come to do, isn't it? We come to give our hearts to him, to worship him, to yield to him, to adore him, love him, not just in here, but when we go out, go home and into our workplaces and whatever else we come, we do during the course of the week. He's a wonderful God and uh, it's good to know that and a God who speaks to us. So this morning I want to think about listening um, and I've got some clips, children, there's some here for you, grown-ups, there's some here for you as well. I hope this is going to work. I've got, I think, five or six things. And there's no pictures, it's just listening. Martin, we need to have the volume up. Some one or two of these are a little bit quiet. I'm in your hands this morning because I don't think I can control this on the clicker as such. So what I need you to do is just listen and from the voice, I want you to tell me who it is that's speaking, okay? It's going to be a challenge for some of us. Here we go, first one. To infinity and beyond! Right, right, let's have the children first. Stuart! <laughs> Do you agree? Yeah, Buzz Lightyear. Okay, that's good. Right, let's have number two. Some people are worth melting for. Did you get it? Who knows that one? You're only getting one go. Samuel. It was Olaf. Yes. From the film Frozen. I didn't know that one either. Good. Just from the voice. Struggling. Lots of other people. Right, next one. No, yeah. no, yeah. no. <laughs> right, let's do that one all together. Margaret Thatcher, yeah. Did you know that one, Caleb? Very good. I thought, I'm not, the children won't know that one. That was donkeys years ago. It was ages ago. Right, number four. In every job that must be done, there is an element of fun. Yeah, no, that's good. Mary Poppins, yeah. Right, number five, are we five? Yep. Keep swimming, just keep swimming, just keep swimming, swimming, swimming. Got it. Got Rory. Dory, yes. It is from Finding Nemo, but it's actually Dory when he comes and rescues or takes Nemo and takes him swimming, just keeps swimming. Right, okay, uh, number, number five, last one. No, number six, last one. Me want cookie! Oh, <laughs> me want cookie. Ted, the cookie monster, yes. Indeed, from Sesame Street. You all knew that, didn't you? Of course you did. You all knew me want cookie, even if you didn't know who it was. Right, so those are people. Did you, did you find it easy or hard? Just listening to voices, just listening to the sounds. How many of you knew all of those? Anybody know all of those? Right, it's hard, isn't it? Particularly if you don't know the film. I, confession time this morning, you might guess. I have never watched Frozen. Around children of a certain age, never watched Frozen. I had no idea of that until the thing that I was looking at to help me here um, guided me along the way. So if you don't know the film or you don't know the character, you're not going to get it, are you? It's hard. Children, did you all know that one Margaret Thatcher? No, no, no. No, because that was a long time before you were born. I was quite young. I was 19, it would be 1980s. Years ago, years ago, possibly even before your mum was born. I don't know. But if you know the film, or if you know the person, you will hear the voice, and you'll know who it is. Here's another one. It's not going to come on the screen, but who, I wonder if you know who said this. Love each other as I have loved you. Love each other as I have loved you. Who do you think said that? Who recognises that comment? 
Not with my voice, probably, but uh, Caleb, it was Jesus, that's right. The knowing the kind of things that Jesus would say, knowing his voice. He says in the Bible that those who love me know my voice. And so it's good. When we hear things like that, and when we, when we love Jesus, we will, we will hear him. He will speak to us. This week I was doing something. And, and something came into my mind, and I just knew that that was Jesus speaking to me. I didn't hear, an old, I didn't hear a loud voice. It wasn't a, a, an out loud voice, but I just felt inside, I just knew it was Jesus. And then I went somewhere, and somebody said something that told me that that was right, that was Jesus. Sometimes you just know, and when it says the right things, and it talks about loving people and forgiving people and being kind to people... You know that. You know that's Jesus. When you're perhaps struggling with your sister or your brother and you're getting annoyed with mum or dad or your grown-up or your teacher or your husband or your wife or your children and something nudges you and tells you that's not right, that's almost certainly Jesus that's nudging you because that's the kind of thing. He says about forgiving Instead of being kind, that's being generous, that's the kind of thing that Jesus would say. We need to stop and we need to listen. And of course we then need to do what Jesus says. He's not a cartoon character, he's not Dory, he's not Buzz Lightyear. Jesus was real and he is real, he's living in heaven today and he still speaks to us and he said that his people will follow his voice. So just a little reminder for us this morning. You've heard Sundays in Lighthouse this morning. You've heard about Jesus. You've heard about God. Make sure you do. Whatever you heard in there, whatever the, the story was, whatever the thing was about doing, make sure, children, that you do it, and adults, as we hear God speak to us in his word, let's make sure that we do it. Let's pray, and uh, then we're going to sing a song about the shepherd and uh, being able to trust him. Lord Jesus, we thank you that uh, you are still alive, you are in heaven, and you still speak today to us. You speak to us through the Bible, you speak to us by the Holy Spirit, you speak to us through the, the still small voice of conscience in our hearts to children and to older people. Would you help us all to be those who listen to your voice? Help us to get to know you well enough so that we just know when it's you. Help us to do this for your sake. Amen. Music team, come and join us. We are going to sing The Lord's My Shepherd. I'll not want, he makes me lie in pastures green. And I will trust in him. Lord's my shepherd, I
Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, I pray that you would continue to mold us all into the children you have called us to be. I can't say enough words to thank you for the church family given to us all, Lord. And please help us to all be loving, kind, forgiving, understanding, and also help us all to pursue glory for your church and you, and to set aside our personal goals and private ambitions, and help us to remember we are brothers and sisters in Christ first, despite our differences and many beautiful characters. I thank you, Lord, for a nation that we can still gather to worship you, to come together and celebrate that you are our Savior. And please be with our brothers and sisters in countries where they are persecuted if they follow you. Please give them strength and courage for every day. Dear Lord, give us peace during this difficult, uncertain times with high cost of living and troubles of war and oppression all around the globe. Dear Lord, I also pray for those who are hurting or have health issues in our church family, for those that have worries. Please, Lord, young and old alike, be with them, comfort them. Father, I pray that they turn to you, to you and know that you are right there beside them in their time of need. Lord, please give our church peace in the knowledge that your hand is on us. May your will be done in their lives this day, Lords. Lead us, Father. You are sovereign over all things, and I pray that you open the hearts of this congregation to our leaders to lead us in song and sermon. Thank you for our leaders, Father, and help them in their daily struggles at home and work and at church, please, Lord. You are the one who have accomplished the growth of your church, Lord. You are moving in people's hearts right now. And we all need to focus on you and not ourselves. I thank you for the gospel for us, Lord. Help us to understand how great and glorious gift your salvation is. Give us wisdom to what to do in these times that we are in. To give us strength and boldness to share with those in our circles. And those whose immortal souls are hanging in the balance, Lord. An earnestness for your gospel, Lord. And a conviction that will make hearts open to you. And let us give you all the praise in our endeavors, Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, this morning's reading is taken from Exodus chapter 6, verses 1 to 12. Exodus 6, 1 to 12. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Because of my mighty hand, he will let them go. Because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of his country. God also said to Moses, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, where they resided as foreigners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the Israelites whom the Egyptians are enslaving, and I have remembered my covenant. Therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. And I will bring you to the land I swore with upland, uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you as, as a possession. I am the Lord." Moses reported this to the Israelites, but they did not listen to him because of their discouragement and harsh labor. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go, tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the Israelites go out of his country. But Moses said to the Lord, If the Israelites will not listen to me, why would Pharaoh listen to me, since I speak with faltering lips? 
and we pray that God will bless his word to us. Mm. Thanks, Roy, and uh, I'm sure he will as we listen to him this morning. The, the words <clears throat> that, that I want to come from, if you like, the launch pad for this morning are actually in the chapter before this. I want to ask, answer this question. It's a, it's a question that, that King Pharaoh or Pharaoh asked. Um, he says, who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? Immediately before that, it says that Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, let my people go so that I may hold a festival to me or that they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. I think most of us here will know the background to this. Just in case you don't, let me just let me fill you in a little bit on what's happening here by way of context. The, the people of God, the, the Israelites, have been for 450 years, if we'll take a year or two, uh, living in Egypt. And for the latter part of that time, the Egyptians have enslaved them out of fear that the Israelites might become too populous, uh, too powerful, too influential, and that they might actually usurp authority and start to impose their culture on the people and on the nation of Egypt. And so the succession of Egyptian leaders had subjugated the Israelites to increasing level of servitude. And so the Israelites, instead of being a free people living as a, uh, as a group of people allowed to live their own way in part of Egypt, have been uh, brought under a situation where their freedoms have gradually been eroded. Because to me, feels to me, even as I say that, that a lot of Christians in our world feel the same. And even in our own country, there is an increasing sense that to be a Christian, to be a follower of Jesus, is to marginalize us and to push us and to take away our freedoms. That's a separate kind of thing. But that's what's been going on here for a number of years until the point that the people are just begging God to come and change things. The result of that, God speaks to Moses and calls him and says, go to Pharaoh and give him this message that I am going to intervene, I'm going to do something, and you are going to let him or let them go. And that's what we have in chapter 5 here. So that's a long story cut short for you. Moses goes, let my people go. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, let my people go. Pharaoh's response is this. Who is the Lord that I should listen to him? Who is he? And it's a good question. As Christians, as the church, we will often say, God says this, the Lord says that. On what basis do we say that? On what basis do we build? What is the authority of what we're doing? You can almost hear the uh, the emphasis in, in Pharaoh's voice as in his response. Who is the Lord that, that I, I should obey him? I, the great Pharaoh, the leader of the greatest nation on earth at this point. Who am I that I should listen to this Lord of my servants, my slaves? Why would I, the great Pharaoh, listen to a God you can't even see, and a God who's let his people become slaves. There is, you get this sense of the arrogance of the man. Well, he's about to find out. Pharaoh's about to find out exactly who this Lord is. He's about to discover the greatness and the power and the might of God and who he really is. And that's the theme if you want to read the rest of the book of Exodus, that's the theme of Exodus. It's a book not just about the Israelites and their story of release from, uh, from Egypt. It's a story about the greatness of God. The Exodus is all about God. 
It's all about the power of God, the kindness of God, the might of this God. A little picture to show you on here. You may be familiar with these. They're leaf cutter ants. They are, I've read, the strongest creature on earth compared to size. Apparently, and some of you may know better, and if that, that exact detail is wrong, well, I'm sure uh, you know, we're happy to concede on that. But the point is they are, they are strong beyond their size. They can lift something 50 times their own body weight. 50 times. That would be like one of us going outside, getting hold of Callum's van, his work van, that's probably loaded up with his stuff as well, and lifting it up off the ground. I mean, it's preposterous. None of us could even try to do that. But I use that simply as a comparative illustration. Because as an ant is dwarfed by our human strength, we are great, but we are not as strong as the ant by size. Pharaoh is about to find out that he, with all his might and all his power and influence, is dwarfed by the power and the might of God. And so chapter 6 that Roy read starts with those words. Now the Lord said to Moses, now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should listen to him? And the Lord turns around and says, now you'll see what I will do to Pharaoh. Because of my mighty hand, he will let them go. Because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of the country. It's like God is saying to Moses, and eventually through Moses to, to Pharaoh and to the people, okay, you've had your say, you've had your try, now watch what I'm going to do. He's defied He's defied me. Now, just stand back and watch in awe. I will show Pharaoh what power really is. This is where I get to show what I am, who I am, as I start to unleash my glory in a God-ignoring, sin-darkened world and to an ignorant person. I think it's really important for us to keep our confidence in the Lord. Who is the Lord? We live in a world where we are increasingly feeling threatened. We live in a world and in a culture where people will arrogantly, outrightly, boldly, in effect, say, who is the Lord? Why should I listen to him? We get the arrogance of people like, maybe less so these days, thankfully, but the arrogance of people like Richard Dawkins, who stands against everything that God stands for, or Stephen Fry. I don't know if you remember, a few years ago he was asked a question on Irish television. If you got to the pearly gates and, were, and met with God and you could ask him one question, what would, what would you say to him? And this was Stephen Fry's response. <clears throat> this was his response. How dare you? How dare you create a world where there is such misery that is not our fault? The arrogance of a man to stand before God. Now, I understand the question because it's not an easy one to understand, but it's that how dare you attitude, and that's what we have in our culture these days, people standing up before God. And as in this passage, we have the Lord coming to Moses and said, now stand back and watch what I am. Watch what I can do. Can't stand back and see power. And he's going to show that to Pharaoh. He is, if you like, going to put Pharaoh in his place. But not only does he put Pharaoh in his place, as he does that, he provides tremendous reassurance and instills confidence and hope in his people. So I don't know where you stand this morning in terms of thinking of God and what your, what your belief is in him. But whether you're a believer as you've come through the door this morning, or whether you would say, I'm not yet a believer, I believe there's something here for us all to learn and be reminded about. If you're not a believer, then I would humbly ask you just to take on board, listen to what this is, and 
start to think through the implications of what we're going to see. And if you're a believer already, then I want you to have confidence and reassurance and hope in the great God that reveals himself in this passage. Pharaoh is about to find out how awful it is to be on the wrong side of God. The Israelites, God's people, are about to find out how wonderful it is to be on his side. So let me start then and and look firstly at this statement here in verse 2 where he says, I am the Lord. I am the Lord. I appear to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob as Lord Almighty, but by my name, the Lord... I did not make myself known to them. Until this point, you see, God has revealed himself as the Lord Almighty. Generally, when he's spoken to people, he said, I am the Lord Almighty. The the Hebrew word there, and some of you will know, be familiar with this, is the word Al Shaddai, which literally means the God of enough. I am the God of enough. Until this point. That's how he generally revealed himself. That's how people understood him, as the God of enough. When he first spoke to childless Abraham in Genesis chapter 17, verse 1, and promised Abraham that he would have descendants as sand on the seashore, even though Sarah was 90 and Abraham was 99, and until that point they hadn't had a child of their own, he comes to them, and says, Abraham at 99, Sarah at 90, I am the God of enough. Physically it's impossible, but I'm coming to you as Al Shaddai, the God of enough. With me all things are possible. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. And so as the story goes on, we find that Sarah indeed did have a child. And his descendants became the Israelites, the people that we're talking about here that were enslaved to the Egyptians. They had become like the sand of the seashore. The Egyptians were fearful that they would overrun their country. But he revealed himself to Abraham at that point as the God of enough. And later on, when Abraham's grandson, Jacob, had to send his, or allow his children to go down to Egypt to buy grain. This is way before they've been taken as slaves, way before that time. He's living in a different part of the world at that point. But there was a famine, and they, the only place they could get food to survive was to go down to Egypt. And he's concerned as to what will happen to his children. When he eventually lets them go, he, said he entrusted them to Al Shaddai, the God of enough. That was what his hope was in. The God of enough. I have to trust this God that he will take care of them. The God of enough or the God who is sufficient and that's what he proved to be. That was what they knew of him at that time. That They didn't know much but they knew that he was enough for them. Let me just say that, that God is enough for us as well. That God is enough for you this morning in every situation that you are in, whatever situation, whatever problem, whatever mountain that you are facing, whatever trial you're going through, whatever pit, whatever valley, God is enough. He will go with you. He will provide for you. He is all you need. But wonderfully, he says, that's what you've known. Now I'm going to show you even more of you more of me. I'm going to show you more of who I am. And so he comes to them. Chapter 6, he says, the Lord, and it's a different word, it's a different name. It's the Lord is the word Jehovah, or Yahweh is the the Hebrew um, kind of expression here. Al Shaddai, the God of enough, says he's also the Lord, which we tend to call uh, missed that on my thing. The God Almighty, the Lord Almighty. So Yahweh is Almighty, and it's a development on the Lord of enough. Now, he'd never used or seldom used this name before. Occasionally he had, but when he'd used Yahweh, Jehovah, 
He never really explained what it meant. And what he's saying here is, I'm going to show you exactly what my name really means. I'm going to show you who you are. When it says you haven't known me, the word is yada. And yada, the Hebrew word yada is to know. And it's a, it's a word about intimacy. It's about you haven't really, you've, you've known me, but you haven't known me. You know, you know what I mean. You can know people, but you don't know them. You can know of somebody, oh, I know King Charles, I know who he is, but I don't know him. And what the Lord is saying here, you, 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 you knew me, you knew of me, but you didn't know me. Now I'm going to show you more of myself. And in this situation with the Israelites struggling under the oppression of the Egyptians, he says, I am going to show you and you are going to know what I am like. Not just mighty, but I'm personal. And you're going to experience for yourselves exactly the kind of God that I am. And in this passage, as we, as we read it through, and I'm going to read it through again, he shows a whole new dimension about himself, about the way he reacts and relates to people. We see him as the, as the God of, of grace, a God, of, a God who comes to people and gives them things even when they don't deserve it. He's a God who brings deliverance to those who he's called and chosen. We'll see that he's a God that can be trusted. He's a God who is faithful. He's a God who feels and has empathy with his people. Read, them, read those verses again. Look, look at them, follow them along as I read them to you. Verses 4 to 8, if you've got a Bible in front of you. Read them and think about those things that I've just said about trust and about power and about grace and faithfulness and a God who can be trusted. I also establish my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan where they resided as foreigners. Moreover, I have heard the groanings of the Israelites whom the Egyptians were enslaving and I have remembered my covenant. Therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm, with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people. I will be your God, and then you will know that I am the Lord, Yahweh, the Almighty One, your God, who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. He talks about covenant here. And it's because he's made a covenant with them that he will operate and he will act as he does. Therefore, he says, therefore, verse 6, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, because I've remembered my covenant. He's a God who remembers what he has done with them. I made an agreement with Abraham to give you this country, to give you a land of your own. I've, and I will remember, I've remembered it. I'm not forgetting it. I called Abraham. I called him to be mine and I haven't forgotten that I called him. That's grace. That's grace. That's kindness. That's mercy. That's undeserved favor. So here we have a God who's revealing himself, not as a, a, just an angry, powerful God, but a God who's good and a God who's kind and a God who's merciful, a God who's gracious. That is his character. This is our God. This is your God, a God who remembers his word, a God who remembers his promises, a God who's gone into agreement, a covenant with you through Jesus. When you came to faith in him, when you trusted Jesus, you came into a covenant with God. God made a covenant with you. He said, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. No one can pluck you from my hand. This is our God as well. He's not the tyrant, he's not the killjoy. Let's be encouraged by that. But then we might say, but hang on, that was, that was many years ago and the Israelites have been suffering at the hands of the Egyptians for years. If God loves them that much, why has he allowed that to happen? Why haven't they got the land that he'd promised that they would have? Where is the Lord Almighty? Where is Yahweh? Where are his promises? And you might be in a situation or you might be about to go into a situation and say, where is the Lord then? You know, I've said I'll follow him and I've given my heart to him. Where is he? Has he forgotten what he says? God is not a God to forget. 
they were there. They'd gone through this. But God had not forgotten them. And through this deliverance of the people, he was going to show something that we would never have known otherwise. He's going to show his character. He's going to show that he's the Lord, the God of personal care, the God of grace, as well as the God of power. He's going to rescue them. He says, I've heard their groanings. I've heard how they are. He's not ignorant to your cries. He's not ignorant and he's not deaf to your prayers. And like he came at the right time to the Israelites, he will come to you. He will rescue you. He will save you. He was watching over them. He wasn't simply a distant God. He feels for them. He's not forgotten them. And he's a faithful God. There were seven times, if you counted as we went through, seven times in verses 6 to 8, he says, I will. I will bring you out. I will free you. I will redeem you. I will take you as my own. I will be your God. I will bring you out. I will give it to you. I will. The Lord says this. Who then is the Lord? In answer to Pharaoh's question, who is the Lord? He is the Lord of immense power. Pharaoh's about to find that. But the Israelites are to experience now that he's a God who chooses and calls. He's a God who gives hope. He's a God who remembers. He's a God who watches over. And he's a God who will move heaven and hell for his people. He is the one who will save. He is the one who will keep to the uttermost. This is the God that we come week by week to worship. This is the God, those of you who are followers of Jesus, this is the God to whom you gave yourself. He is not simply a distant, unfeeling, unemotional, detached God. He's a God who's come to you, who's given you himself in the Holy Spirit to live in you, who's with you constantly. He's a God who always keeps his word. And you might say, but what about this situation I'm going through? Where is God in that? What about this, this loveless marriage? What about this financial difficulty? What about this, this abuse that's gone on and goes on? What about this mental stuff that I suffer with? Does, what, does he not care? Does he not understand? Why doesn't he change it? And that's why Jesus came, isn't it? That's why Jesus came. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes on him should not perish but have eternal life. And this is where our hope ultimately lies. Yes, he can, change. he can if he wills and if he wants. He can change a situation in life. And some of you have experienced that in life. You've seen miracles. You've seen him work. You've seen him get you through. You've seen him give you strength and courage to get you through the most wretched situations. You've seen health restart, returned and restored where you thought it had gone. But ultimately, our hope rests in the, the return of the Lord Jesus. Ultimately, our hope rests in the fact that Jesus says, I am coming again. Ultimately, our hope rests in heaven. And we've talked a lot about heaven over the last few months, haven't we? But it's where our hope lies. It's the ultimate redemption. It's what Jesus died for. The healings and the, the help and the sustenance that we have through life is a little foretaste of heaven. It's a little foretaste of what we're going to enjoy for all eternity. When Jesus returns, everything is going to be put right. And those who love him are going to be part of that for all eternity. So I want to ask you this morning, is that your hope? Is that your confidence? Will you be there? Will you be with him? The Lord God Almighty, is he your God? If he is, then take courage. Take strength. It might be difficult. But the promise is, I will come again, says Jesus. Just like here, he says, I will come. I will rescue you. He will rescue us. We will be redeemed ultimately, finally, completely when Jesus comes again. But if you're not, if you're not sure of being his child this morning, not sure that he's your saviour, then let me invite you today to come to him. Trust him by faith. Come to him. Admit your sin, say sorry for it, turn round and start to follow him. Yield your life over to him. Receive him as your Lord and your Saviour and know that in this life and in the next life you're safe with him. Who is the Lord? The Lord is the Almighty One. The Lord is the God of grace, the God of love, the God who always keeps his word. Let's be happy as we follow him. Let's be glad, let's be proud of him. Let's live for him and for his 
glory. Let's pray. And then music team are going to come and lead us in that fantastic old hymn, O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder. Lord, we thank you this morning for this revelation of yourself in your word, that, that you are the Lord. You're the God of, you are the God of power. You're the God of enough, but you're more than that. You're a personal God. You're a God who keeps your word. You're a God who hears, a God who sees, a God who comes to rescue, a God who, re, who takes us, who watches over, who hears our prayers, who hears our cries. You're a God who rescues. We thank you for the ultimate rescue that is ours in Jesus. We pray, pray that we might live for him, that we might live with hope. We pray that who you are will give us confidence in the struggles and the trials of this life as we look forward to our eternal home with you in the new heavens and the new earth. So thank you for your revelation and your word to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all thy works, all the works thy hand has made. I see the stars, I hear the mighty thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. And it talks about, talks about the cross, doesn't it? When I think that God, his son, not sparing, it takes us through to when he comes again. This is our God. Let's sing of him. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the work my hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the mighty 
our Father, we thank you for being such a wonderful, kind, gracious, good, powerful, personal God. We want to give you the glory. We want to give you our praise. Would you be with us as we share fellowship, friendship, and food together? We ask your blessing on this time. We thank you for the food that we've all provided and put on the table together. We ask that you'll bless it to us. Would you glorify yourself in all of these things? Go with those who uh, need to go home. Would you go with them? Would you bless them through this week? Would you bless us each? May we have a sense of your presence with us as we linger or as we go home. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.